All right. We'll get started here on our new technologies class. Uh, yeah, my name is Jared Fenn with Pillar and Post. Um, this class is a really hard one because stuff just changes so quick. And the way that the real estate uh, CE classes work is any change, any major change to anything has to be resubmitted, reapproved. So we're going to glide through some of the slides and just kind of skip over those and get towards the end because then at the end after we've gone through the official registered <laughs> class, then we can talk about the stuff that's happened in the last two years. Um, this is class we had for two years ago. So technology two years is time is flying. Uh, usually about two or three weeks. So it's not too bad, but it's a yeah, it's a thirty or sixty dollar fee every time. So uh, so Jared's going to teach this class at the Tech Expo that's coming up on April twenty third, and it'll be different. It'll be different because technology. So is you can just take it again. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we have, we can go home now. Uh, well. <laughs> Sure, but you might not get the credit. Right? So, so this, this is not a core class, it's one CE. Uh, so we're going to go through some of the bigger technologies, things that you're starting to see in a lot of homes. And, and, and if you're selling, especially new homes, new construction, your clients are going to have questions about, well, what about this? And how does this work? And why would I want this? And you know, they're, they're reading these types of things and new features and new tech. And so this is going to help you be able to answer their questions and uh, speak educatedly on some of these topics. Um, so we're going to, these are the main ones we're going to talk about today. Hot water on demand. You know, uh, we're going to talk about heat pumps. Um, that's a big one that we're starting to see a lot of and I don't know why we don't see more of it, but uh, it's finally coming, coming to pass here in Utah. New technologies in air conditioning. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We're not going to spend too much time on that section because even though we live in a desert, this is something that often kind of people aren't aware of. We are in a predominantly heating climate. We heat two thirds out of the year and only cool one third out of the year. So we're not going to spend too much time on new technologies for air conditioning because it doesn't benefit as much as the rest. Uh, we're going to talk about home automation and, and then get into some of the newer technologies, the things that are on the horizon, and things that we can uh, we can look for some of the fun stuff. But hot water demand is probably one of the biggest ones, and I, and I don't know if, if we can really call this new technology because it's been around. I had a uh, tankless water heater in the house that I grew up in as a kid, um, and maybe that might bias some of the discussion that I'm going to give you today because technology has changed from what it was uh, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, so what is an on-demand water heater, tankless water heater? Uh, you've probably heard a lot of different names, but it's basically... Our traditional water heater has a big tank, and it heats that tank up with water, and we have it whenever we want. Um, a tankless water heater is a device that heats the water up as you need it, on demand. So rather than a big tank full of water that's being heated up, your cold water goes in, you have a big burner, and as the water goes by that burner, it heats it up and sends it off to your faucet. So you're only getting the hot water that you need at the time. Let's see. So, tankless uh, versus the tank. Yeah. We will have some points for the next time. Maybe. You'll see my glasses here. Um, so, benefits all the hot water you want. Uh, it can be more efficient because there's no standby heat losses. That's one of the biggest arguments. If you don't use a whole lot of hot water, you have that huge tank, 50 gallon tank, some of you might even have two 50 gallon tanks in your house, and you're heating that water 24 seven and you're only using it for a half hour in the morning when you take a shower, and maybe 20 minutes when you're doing dishes right before dinner. But you're using all that fuel to heat up that much water all day long. So it can be more efficient, maybe we're gonna talk about that. Uh, extra floor space. You know, how much space do two 50 gallon water heaters take up versus an on demand that's mounted on the wall? So, so that's another bonus that, you know, especially in some of these older homes, you're trying to get more efficient. You know, the, the space in your basement can, can make a big difference. Um, downsides upfront costs are higher. So you might be $1,500 to $2,000 to have a new, nice, big system put in where you're six, eight hundred bucks for a water heater. 
Um, it does require an experienced technician to install it properly. There's a lot of you know, gas requirements and food requirements, water pressure requirements that you can't just go down to Home Depot, pick one up, and swap it in like a lot of people do with their water heaters. Um, a lot of ways you can go wrong. And uh, one of the big downsides a lot of people don't realize if your power goes out, you don't have hot water because these are have some electronic controls. So let's talk about energy efficiency, because that's really the biggest one. That's what people always say, yeah, you know, I want to get more energy efficient, so yeah, we're going to get one of these tankless water heaters. Well, they're more expensive up front, but yeah, they're going to save me in the long run. That depends. It really depends on your lifestyle and your, your family and how you're going to be using it. The Department of Energy put this, these statistics out. If you use more than 41 gallons per day, or less than 41 gallons today, you're going to see a 24 to 34% energy efficiency saving. However, if you use more than that, you're only 8 to 14%. Um, then they had another figure, just something to talk about, that they do make small, little ones. You see more, most of these in commercial, like in the bathroom, so you don't need a big water heater. It's just to wash your hands. And so that little ones. So actually, if you did have a smaller one, Mounted for each individual faucet, you can see savings even up to 50%. Why is that? Why would that make any difference? Think about if you have a 5,000 square foot house, how far does that water have to travel every time you want hot water? You have to heat that up all the way coming from the, tank, the, the heater to your faucet. Yet if it's right there, you're conserving water and a lot less water you have to uh, Consumer Reports did another study. They said they just said flat out it's about twenty percent saving is all. So a lot of it depends on your lifestyle. Think about it. If you have you're doing laundry all day long, you have you know, kids who are showering in the morning, you're showering in the evening after you go to the gym, you've got dishes that are going maybe morning and night. Is there really standby heat loss with a regular tank? Not not much. Um, so the energy saving is a big <coughs> question mark. If on, on I, I put one in in my home when I lived up in Idaho, and uh, the house was at 92. So the tank that was in there had been in there since 92 and never taken care of. So I had a lot of sludge in the water. We had a lot of hard water. And we noticed a huge savings for us, but both of us worked away from home. We had two small kids. We were saving $30 a month on our gas bill. With, with the tank when you switch from a regular to a tankless. Yeah. And a lot of it can be, yeah, and that's that's the main message. When clients ask me, okay, you know, what do you think about it? it? It really comes back to everybody's, your mileage may vary. I mean, it's going to depend on your lifestyle, how much hot water you use. It's interesting, they did one study, they took a, a small little uh, subdivision, and they went through and they replaced everybody's tanks with a tankless. <coughs> And then they went back and uh, measured, okay, how much energy did we actually save? And the end result was they actually consumed more energy because people were no longer running out of hot water and cutting their showers short. It was, uh, I, I can just keep it. So, again, it really depends on your lifestyle and how you're going to be using it. Uh, how efficient? What was that? How efficient is it? If you've got six kids, you've got five bathrooms, I and... And do you know what I'm saying? And, and how efficient is it how efficient is it at getting hot water to you? It's uh it's gonna be about the same as far as getting the water to you. Um and it really comes back to really if you're thinking about it, because your your traditional water heater might be a sixty thousand BTU, so that's how much fuel and how much that uh, burner's going. But especially if you have a big house with lots of kids and it's sized for your family, that might be point putting out two hundred thousand. So even though the water heat, your normal water heater, it, you know, you drain it all, you just took a big bath, it's full of cold water, it takes, you know, recovery rate on an average water heater might be 40 minutes. It's 40 minutes at 60,000 BTU. Well, I just took a 10 minute shower for 20 minutes at 250,000 BTU. You can, if you start doing the math, you can see that, that water heats up the same. Um, and so the, really the main energy efficiency that comes with a tankless water heater is the standby heat loss. So if your tank is 
sitting there idle and the burner keeps coming on just to maintain that temperature, especially if you have it cranked up. You know, a normal water heater you, is recommended 130 degrees, but maybe you have it set at 150 for whatever reason. That's just that much more time it's going to be kicking on. So the efficiency really comes down to how much standby are you wasting? Because um, if you have two 50 gallon water heaters, and they're all hot, and everybody can have a shower and do whatever. But you're saying it's going to take the same time, even though that hot water is ready, it's going to take the same time for the tankless to give you that? Yeah, because the burner is five times hotter. So as the water is running through, so the, the, the delay to that is still going to be the same. From the tank to faucet is still going to be the same, same amount. Jared, this is, I mean, this is kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> You know, we just found out that our legislature decided that they didn't like the clean air stuff, so they're not going to do that. But as far as clean air goes, um, I've been to, to a couple of uh, conferences for I'm doing city planning stuff right now, and they say that probably the next thing that they can really work on um, that, that effectively they could change is, is our hot water heaters right now are a, a very large, very changeable pollutant source. And, and so how much more efficient are they in terms of, I mean, I've seen some of them that have the little, you know, drain line at the bottom that, that drains the CO in water out the bottom into the, to the drain instead of putting it up into, yeah, I mean, tell us about that. So you do have, just like you do with furnaces, you have a, a conventional mid-efficiency furnace or a high-efficiency furnace. And how that's working is that that flue that's carrying all the exhaust is pretty hot. I mean, if you've ever reached and touched that metal flue, it's hot. So why not take that heat? And so with any high-efficiency system, like a furnace or a water heater, that, that flue is then routed and the water is run through around that flue as well and pulls some of that heat. In that process, it causes condensation. That's what you see with a lot of that condensation, and we can carry some of those pollutants out with the condensation down the drain. So yeah, so even within the range of the, the water heaters, just like with furnaces, you have a range of, you know, maybe it's an 80% efficient up to a 95% efficiency, which means I'm spending a dollar's worth of fuel, and I'm getting 80 cents worth of heat or 95 cents worth of heat. So the same principle applies whether it's a furnace or a water heater. And I don't know what the, I'm not familiar with what the actual efficiency ratings are on water heaters. I do know that the high efficiency water heaters, you're, you're an even, just like the furnaces, another big upfront cost. Um, they do have some benefits too, just like a high efficiency furnace, that you have a little bit more placement. Because with one, another downside, maybe it's on a different slide, um, is you're kind of limited to where some of these larger tankless water heaters can be mounted. So especially, uh, you have a big unfinished basement, and you want to put swap out your water heaters for a tankless, and your utility is in the middle of your basement, you might have a problem. A lot of these tankless have to be mounted on an exterior wall um, just because they can't, that flue can't be running through your house. It has to go immediately to the outside. So, so there's other requirements, but a high efficiency because you're pulling all that heat out. So there's a lot of other variables there. Um, but as far as the pollutant, I'm not sure on that one. Um, so if, if you're not, I'm kind of biased against the tankless water heaters. Um, we'll probably get one in our house eventually just because my wife has a big tub and she likes to let that hot water run and doesn't want to run out of hot water. Because we have that basement apartment that also draws off, so if they decide to use a bunch of hot water, um, so for that reason, the tank would make sense for us. Um, I had bad experiences that, and this is where we talk about new technology. Technology has changed a lot with tank with tankless water heaters. Um, so the one that I had growing up, it, the benefit you didn't have to worry. They, there's no there's no brain, no computer control, pressure, temperature, all of that. It was it was all mechanical, and so it would adjust the temperature by the volume. So obviously if more water goes through it faster, it, the temperature is lower. Does that make sense? And if less water is going through, then the temperature will be higher. So that was just a common rule in our home. You know, I'm going to take a shower, don't flush the toilet. Because if someone flushed the toilet somewhere else in the house, that would decrease the pressure and you would get scalding water on your back. 
Or if someone decided to flip on the hot water in the, you know, to go to do the dishes, now I get ice cold water on my back. <coughs> so I, I, I don't have a lot of fond memories of, of the tankless water heaters. But that's where new technology has really come in. All of that is regulated with, with pressure monitors and temperature sensors so that you know, you're not getting your kids scalding showers. What about the annual maintenance costs? Uh, as far as lifespan maintenance, your uh, they do have a 20 year lifespan on average, 15 to 20. They can have some other things, but you should be doing that with your regular water here. So, at least from what I've read, it's not too much difference as far as maintenance. And if you, uh, it depends on the type of water you have too. Like, uh, we had extremely hard water up there in Idaho. Um, so, we had to have a water softener. We did have a water softener and keep it uh, going all the time. Then we would have to flush it. Yeah, because you're 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 running a ton of water <coughs> through through very small tubes. This is kind of exaggerated, but in a lot of cases it can be very small tubes, kind of like through a radiator. And you can imagine any sediment buildup or anything like that that's going to clog that up is going to have a much bigger impact compared to a regular tank. With, with the water software, we were able to go every two years afterwards doing a flush on it. Okay, some other things to consider if you're thinking about upgrading. Uh, are you going to use more hot water? You know, if you're really getting it for the energy efficiency, what are you going to do to control that? That can be compensated with low flow um, shower heads, low flow faucets, other things that are more of a water conservation uh, that can compensate for it. Um, the other things you need to keep in mind is larger households. Uh, a lot of these are sized based on, well, how many bathrooms could be running at the same time? You need to keep in mind, maybe I like to jump in the shower right after I've just set the dishwasher to go and I just threw a load of laundry in. You might not be able to do that with, you know, unless you oversize that tankless water here. So there's a lot of other things to take into, into account. Um, and then, yeah, temperature variances, and that's where a lot of the newer technology really helps out so that you're getting a more uh, continual flow of temperature. Any questions on tankless water heaters? <coughs> okay. Like I said, we're kind of just skimming over a lot of these um, technologies. You can almost have a whole class on each one of them. But So heat pump is, is not something that's new. Uh, but because some things in manufacturing and technologies that are changing, uh, a bigger awareness of, of energy efficiency and conservation, uh, they're becoming more popular. So you might not have heard about a heat pump, but you've probably heard of, there's a lot of builders that are doing geothermal, okay? Um, a lot of people think of geothermal as actually you know, tapping into some underground you know, hot pot, you know, something like you'd see in Yellowstone, and you're funneling that into your house. That, that is a type of geothermal, but that's not what we're talking about, and that's usually not what's happening here locally. Uh, a heat pump is, well, let's, let's, uh, let's talk about kind of what, think about an air conditioner. What does an air conditioner do? Basically, it takes the heat out of your house and pushes it outside. It moves heat. That's really what an air conditioner is doing, right? Because if you go and stand outside next to that, that compressor, it's blowing very warm air. And that's the heat that it's pulled out of your house. What does a refrigerator do? Same thing. If any heat or warmth in the fridge, it pulls that out. If you get back behind or underneath your refrigerator, you're going to feel that heat being expelled. So what a heat pump is, is an air conditioner running in reverse. So instead of trying to get the heat out, it's able to take heat from the outside, even when there isn't very much heat, and able to condense that, compress that, and move it into your home to heat your home. So even when it's 40 degrees outside, there's still enough heat that mechanically, chemically, physically, it can take that heat up 40 degree temperatures outside and turn it into 75 degree temperatures inside. That's what the heat pumps do. Okay, so there's your basic air conditioner. Okay, we're talking about that. Um, <coughs> so.
So the main thing, why don't we see, why doesn't everybody have heat pumps here in Utah? The main reason is that a heat pump has just the chemistry of it, there's a, there's a balance point where a heat pump is very efficient, especially like in your 40, 50 degree temperatures. Once you get down to about freezing, you get to this point where you have to have some other supplemental heat because there's just not enough heat when it's 35 degrees outside. There just isn't enough heat to keep up with, with especially a poorly uh, insulated home. So that's probably why we don't see it a lot here in Utah is because we do have a few weeks out of every year where it's going to get below freezing and we need to compensate for that. And so it doesn't make sense to go and put in a heat pump, um, an air source heat pump that's pulling that heat out of the air and then you have to put in a furnace or some other type of heat to supplement it when it can't keep up. But there's an alternative and that's geothermal. If you dip down into the earth you know, there's a pretty common rule of thumb. If you go 10 feet below the surface, the temperature of the soil, 10 feet below the surface, will be equivalent to the temperature, the average temperature annually. So in Provo, I think it was last year, I don't know where I ran the numbers, the average temperature was, I'm going to slide on here somewhere, it was like 53 degrees. So if you took all the highs and low, what's the average temperature annually? It's low 50s. You dig down 10 feet in the soil, <coughs> it's low 50s. So a heat pump, instead of trying to pull you know, heat out of the air when it's only 30 or 40 degrees, if you can pull that heat out of the ground where it's always 50 degrees, it's always going to be efficient. It's always going to work. And how efficient are we talking? So we were, just, we were just talking about furnaces. Furnaces, you get a really efficient furnace, it might be a 95% efficient furnace. Meaning, I get 95 cents of heat, for every dollar of fuel that I put into it. A geothermal, they use a different calculation, but in many cases, they're going to be running off electricity to help run all those pumps and motors. You're going to spend a dollar in energy and fuel, electricity, and you could get $2.50 to $3 in heat out of it. So extremely efficient compared to the alternative. Why isn't everybody doing that? Well, the cost. You're starting to see builders now are able to do that when you're excavating all this and you can lay the groundwork for the geothermal all at the same time, it makes sense, but it is a much bigger upfront cost. Um, insulation cost, payback time might be 12 to 15 years. There are a lot of government incentives that can help reduce that even more right now because of the energy efficiency. Um, you know, but uh, Again, it's more expensive up front. If you're doing it with brand new construction, all that gets worked into the cost, and so that's why you're starting to see more and more builders doing that. So with smaller lots that they're doing, 0.18, are you able to do geothermal with such a small area? Yeah, they've actually come out, one of the other newer things is they're, they're coming up, instead of running your geothermal in a field, they're going down 30, 50 feet, and, and so that those loops are actually going <coughs> instead of horizontal. And so that's how they're starting to do some of that. Um, so these are just some of the factors of why we're starting to see this. Energy is being, you know, we're constantly seeking out more ways to be more energy efficient. Um, you're getting more manufacturers that are getting in the game and, and coming up with them. Some of them are, are able to take their existing, uh, I think it's Bryant and Ream, now have air conditioner systems that for an extra $800, they install a few more components, and now that brand new air conditioner and gas-fired furnace, you know, for an extra $800, it will switch and it also runs at a heat pump. So you're only really using your furnace for those few weeks out of the year, and uh, it, it's really interesting when we get to one of these homes to do the inspection, but they've got a big thermostat, and it's got all kinds of controls. It has sensors for what's the temperature outside, what's the temperature inside. If the temperature outside is above 40 degrees, then we're just going to run the heat pump. But if, uh, you know, let's say we've been out on vacation, we come back and we crank up that, fur that furnace, you know, we want the temperature to rise. So it's got all this logic to figure out, okay, we really need some heat, so turn off the heat pump and run the furnace because that can heat up the house faster. So there's a lot more that goes into it, a lot more technology and a lot more uh, cost up front. But in the long run, th there are some significant savings. Um, so just all that technology of heat pumps, you're starting to see, see it branching out uh, for hot water. 
um, because your furnace and heating your home is your number one source of energy consumption. Number two, your hot water. That's, uh, that's what we were just talking about. So if we can use that technology with a heat pump to heat the hot water, again, that's, that's great. Um, a lot of the geothermal systems, they're actually incorporating that and building a hybrid system so that it can all heat the house and heat the water all at the same time. Um, this is green. Some manufacturers are coming out with heat pumps for the water heaters. Um, just going to touch on these. They're really not a good idea for our climate because your water heater usually sits inside your home. If it's using the surrounding heat to heat the water, it's just pulling heat out of your house, which you're going to have to... So there really isn't any savings. These make a lot of sense if you were living in Phoenix, where a majority of the year you're trying to get the heat out of your home anyway. So rather than the water heater you know, just sitting there heating up water and radiating heat, you're actually pulling around, pulling that heat out. Um, so that's, that's kind of a new technology, not so beneficial for our area, but some things that are coming. Um, Some other cool things that they're trying to do with heat pump technology, because remember, heat pump really the, the technology and the basics of it is it's a system, it's a device for moving temperatures, moving heat to cold. And so one application where they're starting to see it is big, big high-rise buildings, uh, especially with tons of glass, that south-facing side, you know, by 11 o'clock in the morning, they're cranking up the AC. On the north side, shaded, they might still be running the, the heater. So rather than all that consumption with air conditioner and consumption with heating, they're starting to install internal heat pumps that's just moving the heat from one end of the building to the other end of the building. And you've seen huge, dramatic uh, cost savings and energy efficiencies. <coughs> yeah, you can do that. Move it up and down. Um, you're starting to see a lot of uh, geothermal with, um, with uh, pools. Uh, pool heaters that are made with, with geothermal and or not geothermal with, with heat pumps because usually you're only really worry about heating your pool when it's warm outside anyway and uh, so that's another area where you're starting to see it. Any questions on heat pumps? So we have to replace those. The heat pumps, yep, yeah, they're going to have about the same life as your water, well probably a little bit shorter lifespan than your air conditioner, an air source. Because it's going to be your air conditioner system, but now instead of just running for four months out of the year, it's going to be running pretty much year round. So you might be 10 to 15 years on a on an air conditioner heat pump that's being used. In ground. Yeah, in ground, you're looking around 15 to 20 grand for an in ground geothermal. Um, so quite a bit of upfront cost. <coughs> They're usually pretty. I run into too many things. I everything I've read, you're probably in the 20 to 50 year. Um, it's like any other plumbing system. So you, it should be, I mean, 50 years is usually what they get in most plumbing systems now. Um, but I was talking to an inspector up in uh, Nova Scotia or town, somewhere northeastern Canada. And that's all they do is geothermal heat pumps. Um, and they, they run about twenty dollars twenty-five thousand dollars to install, but then you know, they're usually paying for themselves. And, saving money considerably within 10 or 15 years. Okay, we're going to go through air conditioning. Um, air conditioning has changed really a lot as far as any other pretty stable components that we have in our homes, water heaters, furnaces, um, you know, your stove, your microwave, things like that. Air conditioner has actually changed quite a bit compared to all those others. Uh, air conditioners and efficiencies are rated in SEERS. So you have a SEER 8. SEER stands for Seasonal Energy Efficiency Ratio. So you had about a SEER 8 prior to 87. You know, now we're seeing into the 17, even 19, closer to 20 SEER for, for some of your higher end air conditioners now. Um, what does that mean? So this is your efficiency. So 8 SEER compared to a 19 and a half SEER, you're looking at almost a 60% more efficient. So if your, if your air conditioner is more than 15 years old, it's probably in here. So this, this is a real easy calculation when the clients are wondering, okay, should we upgrade or not, or yourselves, is, okay, what's your electric bill in the summer versus the winter? That difference is probably mostly your air conditioning bill. 
If your air conditioning bill can be cut by, if that portion of your electric bill can be cut by 60%, so that is, you have a hot air rises, right? Cold air sinks, hot, cold. In older systems, they would put in big ducts because then you wouldn't, the hot air would just rise up to the rest of the house. Um, in fact, older, original central heating systems, there was no blower. You just had big duct work and the hot air rose out of the crawl space of the basement and heated the room and the cold air fell back down. You've probably seen in those 20, 1920s, 1930 homes, they have a big, huge grate somewhere central on the floor. That's where the cold air would drop back down and warm air would rise. That's how the house heated. Now you have cold air and you try to put an air conditioning system on that and it has to push that cold air through these huge ducts. So newer homes have much smaller ducts so they don't have to have such a big blower. So, so there's lots of things when you're retrofitting and, and you can't just maybe upgrade the air conditioner because the ductwork might not be compatible, um, the blower might not be compatible. Um, the other thing is, is you're getting one of these great high efficiency uh, furnaces or, or air conditioners that there's two parts of the air conditioner. There's the outside that sits, you know, sits outside on the house, but then there's an internal piece here. And the newer one, to be more efficient, might have a much bigger coil, and so you might have a lot more cost involved to try to retrofit them. So it's just something to keep in mind that uh, just you know, it's only five hundred dollars more, but we can get twice the efficiency. Well, five hundred dollars more, but you're gonna have another thousand dollars, and so just make sure you're looking at the big picture. I'll just make sure that's the slide I was looking for earlier. This just tells you this is Provo climate, um, just average highs, average lows, 53.25. That is your your annual high, average highs, but only 65.9. So are we in a predominantly cooling or predominantly heating climate? Predominantly heating. It's about a, a, a one to three. So a third of the year we're running the air conditioner, two thirds of the year we're running the furnace. So, some other points along that, and this plays in with the furnace and with the air conditioner, is the, um, is the, the motors, the blower motors that are, that are starting to be installed, and you can retrofit some systems with it. They're called ECM motors, for electronically commutated motor. The speed can be varied continuously, so it can constantly be monitoring how much pressure is going through. Um, and it's a different kind, it's a DC motor versus an AC motor, which can run a lot more efficiently, doesn't consume as much electricity. Um, so one of, one of the other classes I teach is on air quality, and we talk about just running your furnace with a good quality filter is going to move and filter out and just improve the air quality in your home. And so, so I had a client call back and say, well, you know, we've been talking about that, we talked with our heating guy, and he says that's going to, you know, run our electricity bill way up. And so we started doing some research and doing the math, and, and, and it was surprising. Because I have an ECM motor on my furnace. I run my furnace blower 24-7, 365, and it just keeps the dust down in the house. It makes it better for air quality. Um, but we started doing the math, and your average furnace with today's electricity rates, your average standard blower motor will run you about $700 a year to run it 24-7. An ECM motor will run you about $75 a year. So that's a huge savings in, in cost. Uh, a motor, um, an ECM motor, we had, we had ours replaced a while back, and uh, I think it was like $350. So you just paid for it the first six months of using it, if that's how you're going to use this continuously. So new technology, huge efficiencies. Is that different than a dual stage motor? Yes. A lot of dual stage motors are the ECM because it, it, it already has that. Um, but, um, yeah. Like, the same the same the the like, like if, you, yeah. if you see the furnaces like, like Bryant's or like the 90i, the, the I on the end means that it has the DC motor that is a DC. variable speed. So, on, on the model one, maybe? Well, usually on the front sticker, it'll. Yeah, the model front. Yeah, model. Yeah, because yeah, on the furnace, it's on the inside. Uh, yeah, and I'm not sure. I, I know that almost all of the new ones, but that's <coughs> the last couple of years, most of your newer, higher end ones, um, especially if it's a high efficiency, is going to have the ECM motor. 
But I know that a lot, you know, if the furnace is, if it's one of those 35 year old ones like we were looking at, but most of your furnaces built in the last 10, 15 years, most of them can be, um, you know, this says must have an option for your furnace. So you must have the option to take advantage of some of this, but pretty much anyone can take advantage of this. So you can still get a lot of energy efficiency because it's a DC versus an AC motor. But if it doesn't have the, the brain, the computer chips, to be able to regulate its speed, you won't get that benefit. But So it's still an upgrade that's worth doing. Um, and you can just run the motor on top of the front. Yep. Okay, so I'm trying to kind of go through this. Um, So and another benefit with air conditioners with ECM, one of the big problems with air conditioners is they require a certain amount of air to be flowing over those coils to effectively work. Otherwise, they build up condensation and they ice over. So usually if you have something that's uh, an air conditioner that's icing over, it's usually because the filter is really dirty or the filter hasn't been doing its job and now the coils are all dirty up inside and you're not getting the volume of air across those um, you know, across those coils. And so that condensation isn't drying out, it's freezing up. So one way you can do that is, well, don't put as good of a filter. So maybe you like the filter that's filtering out the mold spores and the pollen and all of that, yeah, but that's restricting airflow. So that's one benefit of the ECM motor is it can <coughs> sense that and it will increase the RPMs to compensate for a filter as it starts to get a little more clogged. Um, so th there's a lot of other, so, Uh, new refrigerants, that's another technology change that happened to how long ago, six, eight years ago, where they stopped doing the R22 because it was bad for the ozone and, and causing environmental issues. You can still do that. They won't manufacture any parts. So if you have an older air conditioner built, probably 10, 15 years or older, just know that a lot of those components might not be available, but they can still recharge it. They can still service it. All the new ones now have the R410A, um, is it Purion, I think is one of the proprietary blends of it, but it's all the same thing, it's all R410A, same for our environment. Really when it comes to heating and cooling systems, the best component that you can have in that whole system is a good technician. Someone that really knows what they're doing and how to make that system operate, having it serviced regularly. It's just like your car, you know, get the oil changed every three to 5,000 miles. And you probably could go 15, 20,000 without an oil change, and maybe not even notice the difference. But you're gonna pay for it down the road. And that's the same thing with, with your heating and cooling system. Getting them tuned up and serviced regularly isn't just about safety, but it's also about efficiency and, and protecting the, the longevity of, uh, of that system. Okay, home automation. Any questions on any of the other stuff before we move into this? Okay, home automation is fun. This is an area where it is constantly changing. But we're going to go through just some of the basics of the more traditional structured wiring versus X10 systems. Um, and then we're going to get into even some of the newer stuff now with Wi Fi, Bluetooth. And there's a million other protocols and things that are happening now. Um, I forgot to check this link and see if it works still. Sorry, there's too many things going on. This was a pretty cool house. A $30 million, I don't know, what's the, what's the British pound at right now? About two to one, so it was a really expensive house. And uh, let's try and go up here. Um, But it, uh, there's some pretty cool homes. You've probably all heard the stories of Bill Gates. You put on a, you know, this was 10, 15 years ago. You know, but, but the whole automation things, you know, in his place, you put on some pendant or something that knew about you and you would broadcast that. As you walked down the hallway, instead of paintings, they were, they were digital panels and it would, 
you know, put up artwork that was more your style, and the 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 you know, background music was more your style of music, depending on which room you were in. Um, so there's home automation features like that, kind of those homes of the future. This house pretty much had it all. Better for thirty million. Sorry, hold on. Zero technology class, we're having technical difficulties. Downstairs, it was a because it was a high rise in London, so it was I think like five stories, you know. So it just looked like a little apartment building, but it actually went four stories below ground. And then the lowest level, they have a, uh, a ballroom, you know, for dancing and entertaining parties. And with the push of the button, the floor drops away and it becomes a swimming pool. Um, they have uh, they had multiple panic rooms and, and secure rooms with with their own dedicated lines. Um, and there was some uh, figure in there of, uh, let's say it was, it was something like 5,000 miles of cabling to run all of the automation and video. A central uh, movie server that had hundreds and hundreds of movie titles that you know, on any of the screens throughout the house you could pull up and watch pretty much any movie that you wanted. Um, so there's a lot of things that you're seeing. If you've done any high-end homes, you've probably seen uh, some of this stuff starting to be incorporated. They do have their downsides. I did one house that uh, was in foreclosure, and uh, they had the, the smart, actually the same kind of smart uh, control floor um, system, and, and something had shorted out. So we, 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 none of the lights, everything had been reset. And so uh, luckily, they, it was the only house that I've ever seen this. They had actually had a backup system installed. So there was a closet up in the upstairs that had about 50 light switches. And so you could actually control every light for every room and home. Unfortunately, they weren't labeled. So, um, so it was yeah, lots of running back and forth in this house to figure out, just to make sure that the lights actually worked. It was just the, the smart system that had, had a problem. Um, but home automation is not new. If you think about a programmable thermostat, that's home automation. We've had those for, what, 30 years, 40 years? Um, basically, you program it so it knows when I'm home during the day, I want it at this temperature. When I'm gone from for work, I want it at this temperature. When I get home from work, I want it at this temperature. When I go to sleep, I want it at this temperature. And on the weekends, I want it to be this temperature during these hours. And so you can get all this automation for controlling your temperature. Um, do you know how much just having a thermostat, especially if you have a lifestyle where you're gone from the house, but even if it's just controlling it so the temperature is, is less, you know, a little bit warmer in the winter, or uh, you're not using as much air conditioning in the summer, not as much heat during the winter during your nighttime. How, how much savings, you know, anyone have an idea how much a, just a thermostat like that will do? And is that the one kind of like Home Depot has uh, for like 300 bucks? Uh, that's the that's the next one. We'll talk about that one. Okay. I have a Nest, and I'm probably saved. I've had, I bought it when it was like, you know, you, 
nobody else could get them for months up to Christmas. Right? So I've got the very first generation. Surprise! And I'd, I'd <laughs> say that it's probably saved 30% in our house. You like yeah, it? The, net, the, the national average like is kind it? of what, just having a, a programmable thermostat and using it is about $75 to $100 a year in savings. They cost you about $50 to $75, but they've paid for themselves. They're most beneficial for a lifestyle where kids and parents are all gone during the day for work, and you know everybody kind of is in bed the rest, you know, eight hours sleeping. Um, you know the college kids that are up all night long, and it's not going to have as much benefit. Um, but other other things that you have, uh, you know, remote motion sensors and light sensors. Those are all forms of automation. So having home automation is nothing new, but we're just taking it to scene levels in some cases of, of what we're, we're automating. Um, you know, now you're getting the thermostats like the Nest that you can control remotely. You can have the app on your phone and control things. You have door locks that you can, you know, did, oh, did I forget to lock my door? Did I forget to close my garage door? Is it still up? Oh, let me just check that. I'm sitting at work and I can pull that up and I can set all that and, and get it taken care of. You know, I have my, my uh, ski lodge up in Park City and we're heading up there. Let's crank that thermostat up to 75 because normally I just keep it at 50 so I'm not paying for all that heat. Crank it up to 75 so when I get there, it's ready to go. Um, so that's kind of where things are going as far as some of that automation. Sure. That last one, the heat, the heat sensor too. You sit still long enough, the lights just go out. The, what was that? The, the oh, lights sit still? Yeah. yeah. I had one of those in an office where I worked a while ago and yet yeah, you'd be sitting there working after hours and about every 10 minutes, you have to like jump up and down and try to get the lights to turn back on. Um, smart lighting, you know, these, these are some of the cool things. Uh, the hard part with some of these smart houses is getting someone to program them all. And uh, you, know, you can have it so smart that, you know, when I go into the bathroom and I hit the light switch to turn on the lights, if it's between 11 o'clock and 6 o'clock at night, I only want it to come to 30% power, so I'm not blinded when I go into the bathroom. Or uh, you can have, you know, a lot of these homes will have mood lighting or, or, or situational lighting controls. So instead of just on and off, you have, I have my watching movie mode, and I'll hit that, and it dims these lights and turns these lights on and drops the screen. Or it's entertaining mode, so I want it full bright. So that you can program all of these variables so that it's one touch of a button and it knows exactly what the situation is. Uh, you have, uh, Blinds, drapes, shades that are now automated. They sense the sun, they drop it down. Um, it can be very helpful if you have a lot of sun exposure windows. Having, excuse me, having that automated so that you don't come home to you know, temperatures 85 degrees in your living room and you have your furniture that's all getting sun bleached. It's taking care of all that. Video and sound distribution, baby monitors, IP webcams. You know, that was fun with our baby, you know, setting that up. so. My wife could check that on her phone instead of having to carry around the little monitor. She was already carrying around her phone. We set that up, but then we hooked it up so I could check in on it. And, you know, while I'm at work, you know, what, what, what's going on, where are people. Um, when it comes to home automation, you really have two factors. One is controlling operational things, and the other is com controlling communication. I mean, those are really the two categories of where a lot of this home automation comes in. Um, there's two main systems that are really the, the tried and true. They've been around for a while. Um, this X10 style is now, I mean, in this category, we'll, we'll break these out and talk about it, but we're now getting, you know, five or six bullet points under here that kind of fit into this, um, into this category. But we have structured wiring. This is what we're going to see a lot. Um, and depending on the level of home, the, you know, the customization, dictate how much of it's going in. But structured wiring basically is low voltage wiring. It's centrally distributed. So usually down in the basement, so we get this a lot, it'll be a new home, and there's just this mess of wires down in the basement. And so the first thing the clients, especially new home buyers, are like, is that dangerous? <laughs> you see all these wires. Um, usually they're going to be yellow or blue. It's kind of the more uh, traditional colors of this low voltage wiring. And that's what it is, is they've run wires to all different parts of the house, mostly what they're going to be for, and the more traditional 
use for these wires is for either internet networking, internet distribution, or through or for telephone. So a lot of contractors, that's another thing that a lot of contractors, it's a newer home, it'll have a phone outlet in every room. And a lot of these new home buyers are like, I don't want a landline, I don't need a telephone in a room, I want internet in every room. The good news is, is that most contractors are just running the same cabling, and so all they have to do is pull it off and put a new type of connector on there, and now they do have internet throughout the whole house, and it's not that much of, a, of an upgrade. Um, so structured rod wiring, it really is something that is a, either a major, very complicated retrofit, or it's something that's being done when the house is being built. It goes in usually before the drywall. Um, one of the downsides is you kind of need to anticipate what your needs are going to be. Um, you know, if you have, you know, we, when I finished my, my basement, as I mentioned, um, we ran a lot of structured wire because the older house didn't have anything. And so we ran, we wanted network cables and but we didn't know what we were going to use it for, and so we, um, my dad at the same time had been building a big, nice, he's a contractor in Montana, and he was finally had the kids out of the house since they were building their dream home, and so he was looking in, and this was right when all the stuff, early 2000s, all the things with structured wiring are starting to come about. And so basically just, you know, we don't really know, so we ran Cat5, three Cat5s and two up coax cables to every single room in the house. Well, it was good because when we first did all that, we had one room as a bedroom, uh, well, two, two rooms as a bedroom, and the third one as an office. And after our second was born, well, bedrooms got rearranged, office got moved to the basement, but we had all that wiring, so the office could be moved. I had all the internet connections and telephone connections I needed. Now the new bedroom had the coax so they could have the television and stuff. So. You have to plan, and sometimes you have to over plan to meet those needs. So that's kind of the downside of the structured wiring. Um, this is a, the upside of the structured wiring is you have that wiring alert. So basically what we're talking about is, is code often requires with new remodels and things that, that the, the detectors are all interconnected. So if one goes off, all of them go off in the house. And so when you're retrofitting and you don't have those wires connecting everything, um, you know, especially in a retrofit where you're just putting in a battery operated, they do have wireless, and, and it depends on the municipality, but a lot of those are being accepted. Okay, we got two run along here. So, Wi-Fi is the next big one with your Androids, with your iPhones. They're starting to do a lot with, rather than using signals sent through the electrical system, now there's things being sent over the internet. So Wi-Fi is really the next big one. Bluetooth is, is kind of along with that. Um, you know, like there have, well, so let me just uh, show you some of the cool stuff that is uh, coming on. There is a... Uh, So this, oh, this uh, is new technology, Microsoft's new PowerPoint that uh, hijacks everything. So okay, so this is just some of the stuff. This is uh, Bob Villa's website, but uh, some of the new things coming out this year. Uh, first one is a uh, drink maker. Hosting those cocktail parties, you can pull up what drink you want on your app, and it will mix it, make it, and uh, dispense it. Uh, this is cool. It uh, connects to your sprinkler system. It uh, connects with local weather stations, so it predicts the weather, knows what weather is coming, and adjusts your your watering times, sprinkler times accordingly. So we're heading into record highs. Let's uh, make sure we sprinkle, do the watering earlier in the morning so less is evaporating. We're going to bump it up maybe 10% more than what we usually do. Or we've got a big storm coming in. Let's shut it down for the next few days until, you know, because it's going to get watered naturally. I, I'm getting one of these um, from a company in American Fork that's called Lono, L-O-N-O. And it was a Kickstarter campaign, and they're just shipping right now. So 
if you guys... The same principle of that. Yeah, principle. same thing. Mm -hmm. um, does it also, also have sensors in the yard? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if this one does. There's another one that Toro uh, puts out that, you, that actually has um, so it's Bluetooth or some, some wireless communication that you go and, and poke them in and they just kind of sit on the ground with their soil sensors and, and that's how it pulls the signal when and how long to water them. Um, you can tell what kind of flowers you have, so if they need more, you'll give them more. <laughs> if they're pink, you'll give them less. <laughs> sure, I definitely need that. Um, this is a new uh, new oven that comes out. It's got a, it doesn't show on the picture, but it's got a, an LCD screen that you can download uh, Android apps, cooking apps. So you can actually choose a recipe tell the oven, yep, I'm making this, and it will automatically sense the temperature and knows how to cook it, how long to cook it, and everything based on, on your recipes and things that you put in. And uh, that was like a robot, that one was not really cool stuff. Uh, light bulbs are just LED bulbs, but they also act as Wi-Fi um, repeaters. So if you're having bad signals, you have a big house, you can replace your bulbs with these, not only the energy efficient, but they'll also capture your Wi-Fi um, internet and redistribute it, amplify it. <laughs> so we'll actually plug in your Wi-Fi and you can use it. You can turn yep, on. you can turn them on, you can adjust them. There's one they have at Costco right now that's Bluetooth. You can actually change the coloring. Uh, this, I, I want this one. This is a new security device. Um, basically, you just set it up. Oh. Set it up, it's got built-in audio, video, video um, so it will video things, but what it does, what's cool about it, is it learns your behaviors. So it takes a few weeks to get up and going, but it's it's used to your behaviors of, okay, I normally get up this long, I, you know, I'm only gone from the house during this time, I'm normally sleeping, and it will send you an alert to your phone if something's out of the ordinary. And you can even set it to, you know, hey, if someone's in the house when normally we aren't, video it. You know, it, and so it, it learns that way. It also has facial recognition on it. Does it have facial? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's cool. So text you and say your son's home slept in school? Yeah, your son's in yeah, son's yeah. Home <laughs> school. Yep. Um, it also had things where you, I mean, so you could just tell it to record. Um, it has voice recognition, so you can say, no, but, you know, it, you can tell it, it, you know, it'll go off with an alarm, or you can say, oh, no, everything's okay. And it's got voice recognition that it knows that it's you. I thought that was pretty um, and that was the end of that one. Close down. There it is. There it is. No, I think that other side of the page is almost there. Lawrence Lawn. Then we'll, let me just we'll watch this and wrap up. Let me just wrap up. There's a lot of new technologies. Another way, I, I skipped over the slide. Uh, microwave water heater. This is so cool. Very nice. Holy. Um, <laughs> microwave water heaters, where they're actually, the water as it goes through the heater is actually zapping it with microwaves, just like, I mean, think how easy it is to heat up a cup of water, and it's zapping that water as it's going through to heat it, so that's another one they're looking at. You have all kinds of smart appliances, um, LG is a big one that um, they have some technologies where you can text with your appliance, so you can, um, it, it, you know, like the, the fridge, and I don't know how, how readily available all these, but some of the things that demoed, you know, that it, it can sense when there's a gallon of milk and how full that milk is. I think they have a special shelf like where you keep your milk. So you can text it, you can actually text your refrigerator and say how much milk do I have left? You have about a half gallon. You know, um, and so you can it can monitor some of those regular staples. You can say, you know, I'll be home by five, and, it, and they've tried to make it so that you can text it like a person. I'm gonna be home by five, I want some coffee ready. Okay, it'll be ready at 505, you know, and so LG is coming out with a lot of uh, smart features that way. But, um, so we'll wrap up, and then we'll take a break. This video is, is that, uh, uh, it's pretty cool house, uh, a lot of automation. Here's it, Kensington. So is this just an ordinary new build muse house? <coughs> Let me give you a clue. There in the walls of this home, there are 30 kilometers of wires just to power the home automation electronics. Well, I've seen a lot of custom electronic installations in high-end houses, and I can tell you this technology-filled TARDIS, number 16, beats them all. So first and basic, this is a five-bedroom, five-bathroom house with 6,500 square feet of accommodation, a lift, and an 80-foot garden. 
It took 1,400 skip boats, it took 12 tons per skip to dig the enormous hole this house stands in. And there are some major surprises inside. Number 16 combines being a beautiful house with the security of a bunker. Now, parking in Kensington is a no nightmare. But no problem here because your vehicles can be kept in this stepping car lift. There are 24 separate audio zones throughout That's the house. So every room has a Crestron panel like that from which you can view uh, films or listen to music from a Kaleidoscape multimedia library downstairs. You can adjust the lighting or you can look at a live stream from any one of the 16 security cameras throughout the house. But even this standard of automated luxury is fairly par for the course in custom installations at this elevated level. This fairly heavy duty door into something unusual. This is a bomb proof, up to 10 kilograms of TNT proof door to the panic bathroom. It's not every home where, if under attack from an international terrorist, you can take a Latin bath. And even watching on the CCTV over there using your waterproof remote. And of course, as befits a panic bathroom, a nice range of panic towels and panic soaps. <laughs> Here's another nice techie flourish. This is a temperature controlled cellar for your 1600 favourite bottles of red wine. The whites, of course, are in a quite different cellar. There's a humidor in there for 3,100 cigars. And uh, the cellar will text you if you leave it open and you're worried about your wine being stolen. And if you're concerned about your teenager and its friends getting into your cellar, don't worry, this control here is biometric, so it will only respond to your finger. And if you're wondering what powers the £250,000 worth of custom electronics in this house, well, it's nothing complicated, really. It's just this £60,000 worth of computer controls. Uh, this actually won the Rack of the Year competition, which uh, means quite a lot in custom installation, but it's, a, it's, it's like a mission control. I don't know how many more times power there is here than we've got man on the moon, but believe me, it can be several. I'm now at the very bottom of the house, 15 metres beneath street level, and of course it's a cinema, a very beautiful cinema. But being 16 South End, it's also a panic cinema, so you have the same uh, thought-proof door here. Uh, so in this room you can forget the heavily armed intruders outside, watch a film, you can use the secure line, which is quite different from the normal line, to call for help, and uh, just sort of relax, really. It's quite a self-contained world down here. This has its own air supply, its own electricity supply, and if by any chance the intruders got beyond that door there, which is highly unlikely, there's another room here, just off the cinema, uh, which is a safe room. And in here, you're going to have CCTV from all security cameras throughout the house. But amazingly, this cinema is still not the pièce de résistance, technological-wise, of this house. At first sight, this looks like just your ordinary dance floor for 60 people, integrated sound system in the ceiling, and so on. But this is not strictly a ballroom. Welcome to the cost of Kensington. Yes, it's the ultimate pool party space. Doubtless, there are some among you thinking what fun it would be to start filling the pool while your friends will be on the dance floor. It's the ultimate techie house. 16 and a half million pounds of it's yours. Thanks for watching Technopolis TV. Okay. Well, thank you guys. Uh, we're going to take a break and start our next class at uh, 4 o'clock.